Hi, so I'm Chris Nee from the University of Toronto. And um, in supernova studies, we often talk about the earliness of a supernova, and that usually refers to how fast you can detect the supernova's light from the moment when it first emerges. And in that sense, 2018 AOZ is the earliest type 1A that we have so far. And I'm going to talk about what we discovered in its earliest signals and how that has advanced our understanding of how type 1A supernovae explode. So first, I'm going to thank all the speakers that came before me for kind of going over all the background information about type 1A supernovae that will kind of recap that the explosions of white dwarf stars, they produce most of the iron and they're very useful for cosmology. And they come from exploding carbon oxygen white dwarfs in binary systems where the mass transfer leads to the explosion. But uncertainties remain with regards to what the companion is, like is it a white dwarf in the double degenerate scenario or is it a main sequence or red giant in the single degenerate scenario. And then with regards to the explosion mechanism, there are several questions. One is what is doing the igniting, like in the Chandrasekhar mass situation where you have a car carbon oxygen ignition, and then in the double detonation scenario where you have a helium shell uh, ignition. And then where does the ignition occur? Like is it happening in the center or is it off center? And then how does the explosion proceed? Does it proceed subsonically or does it go supersonically? Which has implications for say how well mixed the eject ends up being because you can have some subsonic instabilities. There are clues that can be obtained from the early phase within a few hours to days, which Kate McGuire talked about in the talk earlier. Um, the ejecta expanding and colliding into a red giant or main sequence can give some really bright excess emission. But I'm going to kind of expand on that and talk about stuff that's kind of harder to see too. For instance, if you have a white dwarf or helium star present, that could give you excess emission too, but it's just going to be much dimmer and harder to find. Or if you have the white dwarf itself undergoing a shock breakout, that will also give some excess emission, but that is also uh, extremely difficult to find, requiring deep observations as well as high cadence. Um, two things that I'll note is that type 1A supernovae excess emission tends to be thermal in origin because the ejecta is dense at the beginning and then light tends to thermalize. And the second thing I'll note is that earliness corresponds to two things. The earlier you can get it, the farther to the outside the photosphere is. So you're probing the outermost reaches of the supernova ejecta within a day corresponds to about a percent. And then the earlier you can get it, the closer to the progenitor system in radius you're probing. So within about a day, you're getting less than 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14 centimeters. Colors is also especially good because we heard some talks earlier about helium shell detonation. And um, that's a process that's predicted to give you some iron peak elements on the outside. And that can change um, the spectrum. And color is often used as a proxy for spectroscopic features. So with that, we operate the KMT-NET Supernova program. It's a network of uh, three telescopes in the Southern Hemisphere, and that's the KMT-NET. It's actually a telescope network that's for detecting microlensing events for finding uh, exoplanets. We're, we're only using about 17% of the time to conduct the search for infant supernovae. But these telescopes are relatively large. They're all 1.6 meters, which means we can get really deep detection limits in a single pointing. And as I talked about earlier, uh, deep can correspond to early, especially for type 1As, which start off very faint. So deep is early. And uh, we also have multiple colors. So we have BVI bands that are actually relatively sensitive filters. They're narrow, so they're sensitive to spectroscopic features. Um, for a type 1A, for instance, you can have iron lines around 5,000 angstroms. Um, that would be uh, the B and V bands of the KMT net would be sensitive to that maybe more so than even the broader G and R ZTF bands. So given that, uh, here are full color RGB videos of some of the earliest type 1A supernovae. Uh, here's one going off in an elliptical galaxy. And then here's another one that's a, it's a rel relatively dramatic spiral galaxy with the supernova going off there. So I'm gonna be talking about the one on the left which is the, the earliest type 1A that was detected one hour since its first light. Uh, this is what its light curve looks like. And we put out two papers on the supernova this year. There's Ni et al. 2022A, which actually made the cover of Nature Astronomy in May. And this one is about the early detections of the supernova. And then there's a follow-up paper, Ni et al. 2022B, which is about the follow-up observations and, and further constraints on the supernova's origin. Uh, some of our collaborators include Dave Sand from Arizona, who operates the DLT-40 survey, and um, Abby, who is here in the conference. You've probably seen her around. Um, 
With regards to the supernova's light curve, it's apparent from this plot that uh, we're seeing data in a kind of earlier and deeper regime than what has been seen in type 1a so far, like compared to previous early events like 2018 OH, 2017 CBV, and 2011 FE, it's uh, earlier as well as deeper. So we're in a regime where we haven't seen anything before. Um, I'll point out a couple features here. One is there's an uptick in the V and I bands, the green and red data points that indicates there's excess emission presence. And then the B band is completely stalled over the first half day. It's just flat while the V and I bands are rising in like a kind of absolute flux scale. Uh, and what this leads to is this remarkable color evolution where the B minus V color is going extremely red, like redder than anything that has been seen in an early type 1A supernova so far. And this only lasts for half a day before it kind of drops down to look just like what you would expect from a normal type 1A supernova explosion, which really leads you to kind of question how many type 1As are hiding this kind of feature in its uh, first half day light curve. So in addition to this kind of observations, we also have extensive follow-up of this source, uh, UV to near infrared light curves obtained by SWIFT, LCO, DLT40, and ANDICAM. And we also have spectroscopy and light curves going out to the nebular phase several hundred days post-peak. So um, I'm gonna talk about how this extensive data set has um, kind of uh, moved the goalpost or, or advanced our understanding of, um, of uh, how supernovae explode, starting with the uh, infant phase reddening that we saw. So in order to understand where, what is the origin of the reddening, we looked at the SED at the reddest point. So this is what the SED looks like. So first, this is a very weird SED for an early type 1A because um, it's very non-thermal. Like no black body can fit this SED, largely because the B band is extremely low compared to the V and the I bands. And in fact, the B band is just, it just doesn't make any sense because if you just fit black bodies to any two pairs of colors and get a color temperature, the B band implies like a color temperature that's low even for stars, never mind an exploding white dwarf. Whereas the V and I bands kind of give you a temperature that's actually consistent with what you might expect from an exploding white dwarf. Um, so what we investigated was, uh, so what this essentially means is that um, the, there must be some spectroscopic features that are essentially causing the B band to be suppressed with respect to the very close by V band and I bands. Um, so the thing that can suppress the B band in type 1A supernovae is iron peak elements and the magenta curves show what you would expect if you had iron peak elements distributed in the very outer 1% of the supernova's ejecta, which is shown by uh, these, these elements here, uh, composed of nickel, iron, chromium, titanium, and calcium. And the presence of these elements gives you the spectroscopic break that is able to explain the red B minus V color. So it seems like iron peak elements is the origin of the red B minus V color. This kind of distribution is probably what it actually looks like because we also investigate what would happen if you just had a continuous distribution with like a tail of iron out. And it looks more like the gray curve than what you see with the magenta curve. So in terms of the supernova's origin, uh, where can these surface iron peak elements come from? There's uh, two possibilities that come to mind. One is the helium shell detonation that we've been hearing about today. So if you had a helium shell and it detonated, it would leave iron peak elements that can redden the spectrum. And this tends to lead to a supersonic explosion. Uh, the other possibility though is if you had a Chandrasekhar mass explosion, you could get iron peak elements out if it was significantly off-center and it proceeds subsonically in the beginning and make some mixing. So you get a significant, significant amount of mixing. The extreme case of this is if like a plume were to rise out to the surface during the deflagration period, that would create like surface iron peak elements. So um, th this, this, asymmetric, this asymmetric possibility is actually consistent with the nebular phase observations because in the nebular phase, we looked at stable iron and nickel lines, and they seem to be extremely blue shifted, some of the most blue shifted among type 1As actually. So it looks like asymmetry could contribute to the blue shift of iron lines as well as uh, the appearance of uh, iron peak elements. Though this does not exclude the helium shell detonation possibility because uh, Bose et al ran simulations of helium shell detonation and it looks to be pretty asymmetric too. 
So for a recap, what caused the infant reddening in supernova 2018-AOZ? There's two possibilities. One is helium shell double detonation, and the other is a Chandra Sekar mass explosion. Uh, one leads to an asymmetric detonation. The other requires an asymmetric deflagration. And they both produce surface iron peak elements, but one via burnt helium shell and the other via subsonic mixing. So we narrow down two possibilities for the explosion mechanism. Uh, what about the progenitor system? We investigated the progenitor system by looking at the excess emission because um, companion interaction can create excess emission. So we fitted companion interaction, and it seems to indicate companions that are in the white dwarf helium star and low mass main sequence star range. So we're actually probing this regime of white dwarf helium star uh, interactions. Uh, you might think that this is kind of dependent on the success emission coming from that scenario, but we did a kind of simple, simple minded comparison of just what would you expect from the model compared to what do we see? And if it's too bright, then we exclude the model. And we managed to exclude um, this regime, which is consistent with what we got from the fits. So it seems to imply that big companions is less likely. We can get some additional constraints from the nebula spectra, and Dave Sand did some of this analysis where he looked at the nebula spectrum, uh, placed, did some modeling to see how much hydrogen and helium does it emit, because if it was a degenerate, a non-degenerate companion, you would expect some hydrogen and helium to be left over. And he found that not even a trace amount of hydrogen was allowed, so this kind of disfavors um, the right-hand side of this plot. So for the for the for the progenitor system, it seems like we have a favorite um, double degenerate progenitor for this supernova. So in this scenario, what, is the, what, are, what are the possible origins for the excess emission? Well, one clearly is the companion interaction, which we fitted in the beginning, but that's not the only possibility. Uh, another possibility is CSM interaction. So if the white dwarf is accreting some kind of accre accretion disk, you can interact with that and you can produce a, a CSM interaction emission. Uh, nickel 56 in a very thin shell on the outside can also produce some excess emission. And you might think that, well, if we require a nickel to produce the early reddening, can the nickel not also explain the excess emission? Like one mechanism can explain both. And um, well, what we did was we did some, we, we, we have some helium shell double detonation models, which Abby ran for us. And we tried to see if we can have one set of parameters with a helium shell detonation that can explain both. And we found that it's difficult to, like, if you have enough nickel to explain the excess emission as shown by the brown curves, it produces way too much reddening. And if you have just enough to explain the reddening, then it's not enough to explain the excess emission. So if you need the reddening to be explained by nickel, then something else has to produce the excess emission. So for a recap, what's the origin of the excess emission? There's three possibilities. Interaction with companion, uh, interaction with CSM, but in that case, the CSM has to be a, like a small accretion disk kind of business rather than a violent merger. And then radioactive emission from surface nickel, but it's less compatible with reddening, especially for helium shell detonation, which we ran simulations for. And um, that leads to explosion scenarios uh, B6, which we've been hearing about, and a Chandra Sekhar mass explosion is still possible. Um, maybe if you can have one from accretion from a white dwarf or something and it goes asymmetrically. Yeah. I'll leave you guys with this image that I took two days ago. Uh, a tip there's actually a meteor shower that's peaking towards the end of the week, so if after the talks are over, you look up at the sky, you might see a shooting star. Uh, thanks for that nice talk. I'm going to ask a, a dumb question related to what Ashley was talking about before of us theorists and uh, observers converging on what we call things. When you say helium star, wh what do you mean? Is that a helium atmosphere or a helium core white dwarf? We're talking about a stripped star, so a star where the outer layer is... A hot sub dwarf, yeah, then. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. thanks. Hi. Hello. Hi, yeah, this is Viraj from Caltech. Uh, yeah, this is a very cool discovery. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about the observation strategy that you use for this survey and 
mm-hmm. do you mm-hmm. think you can i mean yeah, do you think you can do better like do you think you could get for the next supernova that happens like this do you think you could get a spectrum when it is going undergoing that rapid reddening what are your thoughts on that so the strategy for this um for our survey is um because we have limited time we focus on nearby galaxies within 75 megaparsecs and look for holy grail events but when such an event goes off like 2018 aoz we get extremely deep and early observations of it and um, that's sort of what we were gunning for in this survey uh in terms of spectrum uh right now we still have a lot of human component in terms of uh, evaluating what we should trigger on but for type 1a i think it's relatively difficult compared to other supernovae to have a early spectroscopic trigger because type 1a start off really faint especially for the objects that we're looking for we're looking for the extremely faint regime and at that point point sources are kind of hard to distinguish from noise even for a human so if that's the case you know we require several epochs in order to actually confirm that okay this is an actual supernova that's going off and we should do the triggering you know but even then you know is this a supernova or is it some other like less interesting transient it's also a question yeah so there's a lot of human uh, involvement in deciding that my my human involvement really actually <laughs> yeah uh great talk um do you know anything about the age potentially of the supernova based on its environment or do, can you say anything about oh like the environment age. the delay time so, like yeah yeah so the it's hard <laughs> in, in the movie that i showed before you saw the elliptical galaxy that came from like it was not even in yeah. the elliptical galaxy it's kind of in the halo of the elliptical galaxy right. which indicates to me that there's probably a old yeah. stellar environment yeah although you know we have early ones from young ones too so Thanks Chris that was a, a really nice talk. Uh Ivo Seitensel here from UNSW Canberra. Um because Kate gave her talk earlier and you know she went uh into some detail how uh stable nickel from infra, near near infrared observations can uh you know serve as a discriminant between at least predictions of Chandrasekhar mass models or near ch- and, and subchannel models. Uh, so my question is for AOZ uh do you have any or any plans for nebular IR observations uh, We do to... have nebular observations that contain the stable nickel I think I actually showed a slide of this um this one way back here So this one is showing the complex of iron and nickel um around 7000 angstroms um that 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 is used in say like the flores paper in order to try to discriminate between chandrasekhar and subchandrasekhar but the thing is like um i think i asked kate this question before too which is um what happens with the calcium because like on the one hand um there's the flores et al paper but also double detonation models nowadays are saying that there should be calcium present and we're not really seeing calcium here so i think the story is really unclear as to whether this is definitively a double detonation or a chandrasekhar mass explosion like we're still sticking with the there's two possibilities because the story is not completely out as to so that we can determine thanks for the nice talk can you go back to the plot of the double detonation models i think that abby ran oh yeah i'm, I'm just curious what's in those because at the start of this talk i thought this sounded like smoking gun signature for double detonation but then you showed the plots that showed it's either you know if it's bright enough it's it's not red enough right it was oh, a different plot than this models. i see yeah 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 so i'm just curious what's in those models and if there's anything else that could be added that might change the results i mean we thought about what exactly we can add to fix that discrepancy so the discrepancy is like if you have enough nickel to give us the reddening um it doesn't produce enough excess emission at this er- at the early time um if you have enough to explain the excess emission then it kind of leads to too much reddening and i guess we can imagine that a different composition of uh, the helium shell ash could give slightly different results but abby's models are actually carrying out the nucleosynthesis so it's predicting what the helium ash composition should be and well another clear possibility is since we're kind of in this regime where we're probing effects like collision with a white dwarf or co- collision with the accretion disk you know there's any number of possibilities that could give you emission so emission is kind of i guess uh, cheap um so 
I think it's I think it's possible. I think it's very possible that the excess emission can just come from uh, interaction with the com white dwarf companion or with the accretion disk. Great, thanks. We are out of time, so let's thank Chris again.